Okay. So, hi. Let's talk about macros. Sorry. Yeah, this is it all right now? Good. Uh, yeah, so I will talk about macros. Uh, first, yeah, he introduced me. I do NOM and other stuff. I also work at a hosting company, and we can host your Rust and among other stuff. Uh, so, we are writing a lot of things. I have lots of projects, we can talk about it afterwards. Uh, right now, I'm doing a video toolkit, it's quite fun. So, we were talking about macros. Which macros? Procedural macros, syntax extension, uh, that kind of thing. No. But this is quite cool, except that it's not available and stable. Maybe we could talk about uh, the custom derived stuff. So this is, this is quite interesting, like, okay, we cannot have compiler plugins that are uh, stable, so let's just do an annotation that will, and you get a function that will receive the code and you write code. Like, so basically, you get a string, you, you give a string. And you have a Rust parser that's called sin, uh, that use nom, a fork of nom that's called cnom, uh, to pass Rust code everywhere. So whenever you use that, there are lots of macros as well. But this is still not the point. Uh, I'm basically talking about the declarative macros, like the macro rules and whatever. So why would you use those macros? Uh, I know why, because I can. This is quite annoying. I had a nice effect. So uh, Rust macros are ugly. Yeah, but they allow some flexibility we don't have basically in the language, like generating a lot of code from some kind of templates. So uh, the kind of thing you can do with macros, uh, you can have one that will generate structures and implementation from just an identifier and some types. Uh, you know, like the, uh, the arrays with a static size, you can do implementation from those. Uh, so, there's a feature coming with the associated cons and that kind of thing. Uh, or, no, it, it's instable right now. But before, we had to do like uh, macros everywhere. There's, there's stuff like that all, of the, all over the place in the standard library where you have a macro that will go through integers and uh, make the implementation for each size of array or tuple or whatever. It's quite funny to watch. Uh, you can also use macros like println and other ones. They're quite useful. So it's a very common component in Rust, but uh, most people don't really use them. They have a bad reputation, but thankfully there are people like me that really, really like those, so let's take a look. This is a basic macro, like you saw the previous one, like the generate struct. So this is how it could work. Basically, you define the name of the macro, you define a pattern, like what will go into the parentheses in my macro, and then you write the code. Like, what the thing that, be that begins with the, the dollar sign will be like a kind of variable, it will be replaced inside the code. So here we have an ident, it will be a name, with a, the macro expects a kind of name, and we define a struct called with that name, make the main implementation to generate a new one. And you can then write that for any name. You have a hello struct, you have a world struct, you have whatever, it will work. Uh, we're not limited to just names like that. We have lots of things available in patterns. Uh, so that was the ident. Uh, you can have a pattern, like uh, you, can do, you can have a macro that will take some stuff that will be used in pattern matching. You can use types. You can use, um, what's interesting, the expression, I use that a lot. Like, the macro ex expects something that will be an expression, so it can be a block, it can be a function call, it can be whatever, anything that will return basically a value. And this is a fundamental difference with like C macros, is they, they're kind of smart about what they expect in the input. So they will check things a bit and make sure the code is, is quite all right. So, here we have a macro that's quite simple. Uh, another interesting part is that you can specify different patterns. 
So like this one, we have the default implementation for something. And well, we have no, the, the main one that takes, that takes an expression as default, uh, default number. And we have one where we can call the macro without the second argument, and it will put zero in, the, in its place. So you can make macros with lots and lots of different alternatives like that, and uh, basically call them differently. Like, you know, variadic functions, like that kind of thing. That's the way println and other things work. Uh, an interesting part is the order in which you will declare each alternative is important. So sometimes you will have uh, annoying issues in the way the macros are uh, interpreted, and that's why they're a pain to debug. But we're not there yet. Uh, another interesting part is the macros are hygienic. So, oh, uh, no, wait, there. Um, so basically, here we have an example, like we define a variable that's called state, and we pass that to the macro log. It's, it's from the, the main documentation. Uh, and inside the macro, we have another variable called state, and we will use the expression we get in, in agreement. So you can have this. It's really, really useful. Um, like basically, macro it will be nicely isolated. Uh, there's still one annoying thing is if you want uh, to do like uh, struct, uh, well, method, method calls on structs and stuff, well, you have to pass self to the macro because self will not be available, that kind of thing. This is the kind of issue. But still, this is quite useful. Like if you've debugged some C macros, you've seen that like hygiene is just pain in the ass. Uh, to use them, import them and stuff, uh, sorry, where, where am I? So, sorry, in my, in my notes are, are slid, uh, I have, I'm w off by one, should not happen in Rust. Oh yeah, so repetition. So maybe you see like there's a dollar parents stuff, parents plus, maybe we can expect multiple arguments, and so we can apply the pattern multiple times. So this is the, the thing that was used in the array imp uh, before. So here we define the, the, clone, um, the clone trait for the, the arrays of different sizes. And this is quite small, uh, starting to be a bit harder to read, but it's still doable. I use that kind of thing a lot all over NUM. So with that, like, you, you have already a lot of tools to, to start and write your own macros, so now you have to expose them. So no, yeah, we're there. Uh, basically, to import macros from a crate, you use the macro use uh, annotation. You can use macro use with pa parameters to say, I want this specific macro or that specific one. It's not useful most of the time, but still. And you can export macros for a module, et, et cetera. Uh, what do we have next? Yeah. So a part that's been very confusing uh, for people, it's been like, how do we declare the macro? Do we use the, the, the parents, the, the square brackets, or whatever? And like when I wrote the talk, I was just panicking. Hey, I've always used the same one over and over, and I don't know if they do a different thing. So basically, all the same stacks, they do the same thing. It's just whatever you want. And they will just expand to the same stuff. But there's something interesting uh, you can do is put uh, another layer, because then it will expand to a block. And then inside the block, you will be able to like import stuff, isolate your code, etc. So this is a good technique to, to use in your macros. So this was basically how you write macros. And if you stop there, you're like at num 1.0, which was a pain in the ass to debug, which was made of huge macros. It's still made of huge macros, but they're much more manageable now. And it was really not nice. So how can we improve that? First, uh, where am I again? OK, yeah, printer and macro. So it's the example I was talking about, the, about the repetition. Um, so now we can do some funny stuff. Num is full of macros that call over macros again and again and over and over. 
So to match a macro, the idea is you take an ident, so the thing called submac, you put a bang, then the parents, then the arguments of the macro, then another parent. And then I match something that uh, behaves like a macro, and I can call him, I can call it afterwards. So this is quite cool to do. You can combine stuff very easily that way. And you can go a bit further. Uh, this is an example from the documentation to write HTML from like square brackets. Uh, basically, you have macros calling macros over and over and over. Uh, there's an issue you can run into with this, is that uh, it's a pain to, sometimes the compiler will just throw up and say, okay, there's, a, there's too much recursion, it's a pain, like uh, for the a recent parser I made, the, 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 the compiler said, okay, there's a 64 limit on recursion, no, it should be one, 128 because you do too much. And then I write the next parser and say, okay, 128 was not enough yet. I had to reflect on a bit of stuff. But it gets really annoying to debug at this point, so maybe we will need some tricks for that. I should just fuck that. <laughs> yeah. So let's debug the macros, because that's the biggest pain we have. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you, you just put a, par a parameter somewhere and something else explodes. And you will not know from where it comes, so it's pretty, pretty annoying. So basically, uh, I have a list of tools to use. First one is the prettyfy. Um, basically, you can pass arguments to Rust C or Cargo, and it will expand all the code. Like, it will show you the code just after passing the macros and importing stuff. It's quite useful. Uh, can be a bit verbose at some time, but... Uh, it's quite nice. Uh, so yeah, here we have a macro that will just take a value and replace that with the value plus one. And the code in the end looks like, okay, I, we declare a macro, but then the main function is just value plus one, which was zero. Uh, you can do the trace macro stuff. Trace macro is uh, unstable but I still use it extensively. Basically, you call trace macro true before you use your macro, and then you call trace macro false to stop using because it will just run for every macro, and it will just print how it's expanded. And it got just really nice with recent versions of the compiler. Uh, before, it was just printing everything as fast as possible. Now it's trying to, to uh, make it more readable. And uh, here we have just a very small macro, but in NUM, when you have macros calling macros calling macros, it will say, okay, so this thing is expanded to that, and you to that, and to that, and to that, and you will see where it breaks. So it's quite, quite useful. Uh, there's the log syntax macro, which will, see, which will show like how, it, how something has been called. And there's the last one that's still useful, is stringify. Like basically you call, you wrap whatever with stringify and you'll be able to, to print it. Basically it will make a string. So this is how I make debugging stuff in, in NUM. It's, ba it's basically I, I have a macro that I wrap with a debug and it will print the macro and call it as if it was the, the macro itself. So lots and lots of tools. Uh, it can still take some time to, to debug them and manage them. So I have a few, a few tricks to make sure that your macro will work correctly. So basically, um, I'll just wait because, 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 yep, <laughs> there it is. So uh, first thing, um, in a macro, uh, the place where the macro will be called from may not be uh, inside your crate. So if you have a reference to something that's uh, inside your crate, you have to use the dollar crate uh, name to, to import like your crate name inside. Otherwise, people will have to import the, the, the modules everywhere and it will be quite annoying. Uh, you can do that also for the result option and stuff. And so, since I wrap correctly with the parents and stuff, I can do my import locally, and then have something that 
looks kind of nice in, uh, in Rust code. I had before, uh, everything was fully qualified because I could not do the import and it, it was a bit annoying. This is quite nice to, to write. Like if you see the example of uh, the try macro that was mentioned, mentioned uh, earlier, um, yeah, we fully qualify everything. But the try macro is, okay, if we have, okay, something, we, return the, we give the value. If we have an error, we just do an earlier return. But it's not really nice to read that way because there's dollar crate everywhere. And with the import stuff, it gets more manageable. So I've been rewriting, writing all of them like this. It's quite nice. Uh, another thing that's interesting uh, to fix the error with the macros that expect different stuff uh, depending on the order, um, you have one macro at the, at the end like this, that, they, that expects like, the user facing code. It's how you will call it. And then it called the implementation that will be prefixed with imp so that whatever people are calling, it will not get into those, uh, those alternatives. So you can make a private part for your macro, but it will not uh, be uh, call called by, by people directly. Before I made like a separate macro for that, but then there were people complaining because they were trying to selectively import macros from none, and so like they got the alt macro, and then they, re they, they, they saw they had to also import the alt parser macro, and, or alt imp, or whatever, and it was quite annoying. So you can just fold everything inside one huge macro like that. A very nice trick I really like now, uh, macros will just match patterns. And when you have people that are misusing your macros, usually they will all misuse it the same way. <coughs> so maybe you can match that pattern and show an error message. <coughs> and so there was um, a feature that was merged very recently uh, that's available on Stable. Compiler error will just show an error message at, the, at compile time. <coughs> Sorry. So the idea is um, if you match that pattern, you show an error message with the correct syntax. Uh, this will make the code much easier to debug for, for people. Since um, the macros are a bit weird to use, this is quite good. So another good one, uh, I talked earlier about uh, using stringify and stuff. This is a macro that's used in NOM where if you get a correct value, it will return the value. But if you get an error, it will print the, the macro that was called and the input with a hex dump. You can do that kind of stuff. Uh, it's quite nice to use. And it's just like reusing uh, components we had before. Like we have stringify, we have uh, we matched a macro and called, called it inside of Stringify, but also inside the, the, match, uh, the match pattern. That way, it's, it's quite interesting. And the, the, the interesting thing is the, the debug dump, I can just put it anywhere to wrap any macro, it works. Um, concatident, it's a quite interesting one as well. Uh, might not work for all the use cases you might, you might have in mind, but basically, you have different names, you can concatenate them. Sometimes it's useful, sometimes not. Um, this one is quite fun. Um, basically, uh, basically, I should stop saying basically, it's not basic. Um, <laughs> the, you have the name, the macro in none that's used to generate a function. And you can match on attributes and patterns and stuff and put them on, on the function and it will work. So you can have documentation that's passed to the macro and will be passed to the, to the function afterwards. And uh, oh, the, the last trick is quite tricky. Uh, it takes time to sink in, yeah. Um, this is the topple parser. This is not the worst one I wrote. Um, you have to, to call different uh, parsers in a sequence and return the result as a, as a tuple. And so you see 
the first argument is the input uh, in each pattern, but the second argument is like the expected uh, name of the function, the, the, the expected result. And so we pass through all of the macros, one after another, and accumulate uh, the, the result inside this tuple. And in the last, uh, maybe I can just, uh, no. in, in the last one, we just return the, the, the second argument see when we have no more, uh, no more macros. So this is a pattern that you can use a lot uh, to accumulate stuff, because sometimes <coughs> it's like when you recurse, you accumulate data over and over, but instead of, accu of um, should I say, uh, allocating anything, like it will just write exactly the code you want with one variable. So it's quite interesting. So those were a lot of very weird tricks to write to macro. Uh, basically, you don't have to remember much stuff, just that you can write them so that they're user-friendly. Uh, when you present them to people, they're weird, they're hard to read. So make sure that you can do imports correctly, that you can separate in smaller macros that call each other. It's much more manageable that way. And uh, they're quite fun to write, really. Because you st just start writing code, and then it generates a lot of stuff, and it's, it's quite cool in the end. Thank you. OK, we have a few minutes for questions. I have a suggestion. We can do questions, or we can see the weird, the really weird stuff. Ooh. <laughs> weird stuff? Raise your hands. <laughs> OK. You asked for it. <laughs> Don't regret it. So uh, I, so I showed you the, the num macros. So the thing is, with the, the first agreement is the input. But most of the time, um, I will just, um, where am I? Yep. Yep. So most of the time, yeah, the, the first argument is the input. But when you call uh, a num a parser, you don't pass this argument. That's because uh, the, named, the named function just pass it there. So you see a lot of macros calling each other, and you say, but where is the input? And it's been passed automatically, and you don't see it. And this is confusing a lot of people, because they, they try to call it and just, but what's that I argument that's used everywhere? Shouldn't you call that input? Yeah, maybe, but uh, one character is enough. <laughs> so the permutation combinator is a really great one. Uh, where am I? Yeah, it's there. So the idea is uh, you will try to pass stuff <laughs> to pass stuff in a sequence. Like you have a list of passers to apply, but you don't know in which order they will go. You just know like each of them will be called once. So first, you need to like do permission in it. This is where I create a tuple of the right size which is like basically a just a, a long list of known that will be replaced by some something. Um, then you have the permutation iterator. That's where we call one parser after the next. The idea is, OK, no, don't look at that yet. <laughs> uh, the permutation iterator, you call, if, if the current value for the current result for that parser is known, we call the parser. And if we got a value, we replace by some. Otherwise, we try the next one. So the interesting thing is when we get the result, uh, it's like when we know that all of them are some something instead of known, we want to unwrap all of them. But to get access to one of the parameters, one, one of the elements of a tuple, you do like my tuple dot zero, my tuple dot one, or whatever. So this is why I have this, 
I have the succession combinator that I call a macro with zero and the macro, and it will pass the next integer. And when I get a number and the tuple, I will do tuple dot zero, tuple dot one, and whatever. And I will do all the unwraps like that. This, this is quite interesting to write, really. It took me like a few weeks to just think of how I would do it, and then just a mad evening. Uh, the white space combinator is quite interesting. Uh, at some point, for people that want to write languages, they, they complain that they have to intersperse uh, space eating parsers everywhere. And I say, ah, oh, yeah, that's annoying. Maybe we can write a combinator for that. So you have the WS combinator. You can just wrap a list of macros, and it will automatically insert the space eating parsers everywhere. Like in tuple, you, tuple will be basically in the end a space, take free, space, tag the space. And the way it's done is, well, macros calling macros, like the pair separator, uh, like what we had, it called the separator and calls each macro recursively. We have specific versions of like every combinator for that. And it's a lot of code. And amazingly, it works. But this is still not the worst thing I wrote. So may, may I introduce the Lapin project, which is an AMQP client in Rust, uh, like RabbitMQ, JMS, that kind of stuff. So this protocol is generated from a specification that's written in XML, basically. Uh, that, that's the idea, so they give you this huge file and they say, okay, these are all the methods, all the things you, you can see on the protocol, and so you should probably generate your code like that. And I said, okay, let's make a handlebars uh, template that we call in the build script. And in that handlebars template, I will make norm macros. And I will also use Cookie Factory, which is a nice little project I made. Uh, it's kind of like, mac like NOM, but for serialization. So that's macros all the way there as well. And so here's the template. So it's, it's <coughs> handlebar synt syntax. So the mustache stuff everywhere. And then at some point, we start defining uh, norm parsers and generators with cookie factory. So here it's like for every every method we in the in that class we will generate stuff and we generate st when we serialize we serialize first the ID of the class then the name of the method and whatever. And it gets worse and worse and worse from there. But it was not that hard to write. Like you, you can generate code and you can do very ugly stuff, but it, it's a useful tool. It's not uh, theoretically clean, but it works. Thank you. <laughs>